Welcome. Francophone Digital Humanities. This is actually the initiative, an experiment in thinking with a variety of objects involving quite a number of our colleagues here on campus. A variety of objects stretching from early literary manuscripts in European collections to Aimé Césaire's Cahier d'un retour au pays natal to the Gustave Lanson collection of literary criticism that David Bell here is orchestrating that we have here in Bostock. And here now, film. A thinking experiment intended to promote thinking in French. You hear it right away. We're stuck with the paradox. How can we think in French articulated in English? But perhaps that's one of the additional challenges that we have to play with critically and creatively. Thanks to the support of cultural services of the French Embassy, to the Audiovisualities Lab animated by Jacqueline Weber, among others, and thanks most especially to our first guest this semester, Jean-Francois Guenac, who arrives from one of our long-standing faithful partners in Paris, Université de Paris, Sad Diderot. And Angel Salio, another member of our initiative, will be presenting him this evening. It is uh, with great pleasure that we are welcoming tonight uh, Jean-François Guenoc. Uh, Jean-François Guenoc is a PAG, a professor at the University of uh, Paris Set in the Department of Literature, Art and Cinema. He has a strong in research interest in travel essays both cinematically and textually, uh, concentrating on authors such as Chris Marker, Jean-Daniel Paulet, but also Johan Dan Koken and Gérard Massé. He has publication on Chris Marker on Nicolas Bouvier. And uh, please welcome our guest tonight. Thank you very much. Um, first off, um, I would like to thank professors Helen Salter and Angel Salio for, their, uh, for inviting me to Duke and for this wonderful opportunity to share with you some of my reflection on the contribution of cinematographic studies to the current debate surrounding the digital humanities. But I would also like to, uh, to thank uh, Rachel Rothhandler for um, a translation. So um, if I made some mistakes, uh, the, it's mine. Not her. <laughs> no, no, actually, we should absolutely thank Rachel. She's done great work in a very short time. So. And I, I'm sorry, but I have to face some um, issues, um, technical issues. That's a rebranch of uh, technology, I guess. <laughs> um, so um, I will um, be able to present to show you some pictures and uh, some um, uh, some clips from the, all the movies, uh, but uh, unfortunately, not the all the extract uh, from the, the quotes. So I will be reading my quotes very slowly uh, for you to understand. Uh, first, I would like to, um, to make some comments of, about the title, Chris Marker, The Critical Thinker of Digital Humanity. Um, the vertigo of anthropological revolutions defining digital humanity. I would like to begin my discussion by articulating several key elements in what is often considered a new phase in human evolution. Human beings as defined by the digital or a digital humanity. And here I must clarify that although certainly related, digital humanity is not equivalent to the digital humanities, <coughs> an increasingly popular term in many academic circles, in the US especially. Uh, with its emphasis on all things technology, the idea of a digital humanity has been eagerly embraced by the realm of mass media. This success is also due, in part, to the thrilling sense of vertigo it provokes. Namely, the realization of the reporter's ultimate dream to write history in the present. And this history refers not only to the recounting of events, but also to broader historical structures, those with which inscribe themselves in the long durée. Digital humanity allow us to pass from the chronicle of dates to the anthropology of centuries. This leap in critical reflection was in fact foretold by many scholars, including uh, Lévi-Strauss. He identified three humanisms in Western history, 
the aristocratic humanism of the Renaissance, based in the rediscovery of text from classical antiquity, the bourgeois humanism of exoticism connected to the discovery of the Orient and the Far West, and thirdly, the democratic humanism of the 20th century, namely anthropology, which draws upon the collectivity of all human activities. Philosopher and historian Milad Weri affirms that we are now entering into a fourth age of digital humanism, which he claims in his book, fittingly titled Pour un humanisme numérique, is a result of a convergence between our cultural heritage and a technology which has now become an unprecedented site of sociability. End of quote. On the one hand, digital humanism <coughs> represents a current paradigm of worldview, or Weltanschauung, to use a German word. At the same time, it represents a scientific paradigm of a disciplinary matrix, a term coined by Thomas Samuel Kuhn, and which refers to the set of beliefs, values, and techniques shared by member, members sorry, of a scientific community at a given time. For Milad Doueri, and a great deal of researchers in the information and communication technologies, digital humanism is a Copernican revolution that inverts the status, uh, the status of the digital, transforming it from object into subject. The digital is no longer confined to the ranking of tool, nor is it classified simply as an object of study. The digital is a subject in the sense that it produces a new way to see the world and that it engenders a new understanding of civilization. In one of uh, Dwery or the books, Digital Culture, he uses a religious metaphor to explain the universal appeal for the digital. He also calls for the adoption of an alternative culture which would impose a new paradigm characterized by, I quote, the triumph of hybrid space, of continual transition between the real and the virtual, between the concrete and the imaginary. According to Duery, the radical changes in these categories necessarily lead to a rethinking of the human in his or her entirety. His argument for the establishment of the digital humanities hinges on the following points. The digital cannot be subjected to the categories within the humanities, nor can it be studied within the academic departments of the humanities and social science without profoundly changing them. Because it shapes all that is human, the digital creates new humanities. For Duery, analysis of the digital would therefore necessitate an approach similar to the one developed by Italian philosopher Giambattista Vico in Scienza Nuova, the new, the new science. Vico tells us that the method and study involved in analysis are drawn directly from their objects. I claim that the analysis of digital humanities should be carried out from within digital culture itself. And I believe, as I hope to develop shortly, that Chris Marker offers such an approach within his own cinematographic work. But let us first continue examining, examining the definition of digital humanity in order to better grasp the implications of this shift in civilization. The philosopher Eric Sadam, I don't know if you are familiar with him. Um, I was told that uh, Milan Duery is um, very familiar to the uh, Duke community, but maybe Eric Savin or another French researcher, Paul Mathias, uh, were from another generation. Uh, Eric Savin, in his book, L'Humanité Augmentée, L'Administration Numérique du Monde, in English, roughly, Humanity Enhanced Digital Control of the World, maintains that the transformation of the traditional humanities categories can be traced to the emergence of a human interface plugged into an artificial intelligence. Sadan states, I quote, in the present digital envelopment, it is no longer man who seeks out technology, but technology who comes spontaneously to man by emphasizing the singularity of each individual. Referring to the work of Jeremy Rifkin, he claims that we are passing from the age of access to the age of technological intuition and from a renewed sensation of vertigo to a better understanding of these increasingly rapid anthropological revolutions. In Jeremy Rifkin's view, just as uh, industrial revolution, 
and the rise of consumer society determined the course of the 19th and 20th century, though the inauguration of the World Wide Web marked the advent of the 21st century. History was made the moment that when two million human beings connected to the internet simultaneously, granting them access to infinite masses of information, to globalize commerce and new forms of social interaction. Eric Salam believes that as a revolution takes hold, it will accelerate. This revolution concerns man's relationship to technology, which has become organic. Hence, cite a particularly relevant example, the Dutch screen led to a physical intertwining of humans and technology. The body has become the principal interface of our relations to machine. Soon, intelligent glasses, Google Glass, will allow us to bypass touching. Touching, A mere glance will suffice. Actually, in French, the expression for a glance, un coup d'oeil, literally a hit or slap of the eye, seems particularly well adapted to express this advanced technology of visual touching. Two weeks ago, a French surgeon, equipped with these glasses, operated from the city of Rennes, in Brittany, on a patient in Nagoya, Japan. As this example clearly demonstrates the transhumanist desire to break free from all physical and temporal constraints, to improve our physical and cognitive capacities, and to obviate our natural deficiencies is being fulfilled. This project has been taken up by the great founders of digital enterprise, notably companies like Google, expanding the control of digital technology over the ebb and flow of data and continuing the development of artificial intelligence through algorithm. These corporations are, Eric Sadin tells us, the first to have understood that global knowledge was to be henceforth reproduced in the form of data points. Whether they were the first, I am not sure, but they were certainly the most opportunistic. Freud had already pointed out society increasing technicality in an almost prophetic manner, as exemplified by the following passage from his text Civilization and his text contents. So I will read a long quote. Um, I'm sorry, you can show it on the screen. By means of spectacles, he corrects the defect in the lens of his own eye. By means of the telescope, he sees into the far distance. And by means of the microscope, he overcomes the limits of visibility set by the structure of his retina. In the photographic camera, he has created an instrument which retains the fleeting visual impressions, just as a gramophone disc retains the equally fleeting auditory ones. Both are at bottom materialization of the power he possessive of recollection, his memory. With the help of the telephone, he can hear distances which would be respected as unattainable even in a fairy tale. Man has, as it were, become a kind of prosthetic god. When he puts on all his auxiliary organs, he is truly magnificent. But those organs have not grown onto him, and they still give him much trouble at times. End of quotes. Digital humanity would finally find its definition in this anthropological yearning for prediction. The power of artificial intelligence renders us capable and generates a fathomless flow of data and to act accordingly. The prophetess of the omniscient oracle of Delphi is reincarnated in this new human interface. Such an image calls to mind the Chris Marker film's Level 5 and the name he gives to the cyberspace-like network. Um, he gives the name optional word link. So an owl. The owl is a symbol of Greek antiquity. However, for the romance, an owl's cry foreshadows the death of a loved one. It is clear from their work that psychoanalysis, sorry, as well as filmmaker, understood the dream of technology and hence called attention to the potential ambiguities that could arise from the dream. The um, pictures you see um, on the screen um, is, um, is pictured from the movie A Blade Runner. So one of the few images I've seen. 
I have projected a series of images from several science fiction movie films that I feel that are fitting because their very intention is to project into the future to represent this idea of a digital humanity, to portray, his, um, at, um, to portray it as a life experience. The resulting product is often dysphoric, which is pretty remarkable for an industry that is usually considered prudent and as favoring uh, the happy ending. Of these images, there is one among them that is reminiscent of Marker. While the connection between the JT I don't know if you are familiar with the name La Jeté or the Waterfront. Um, we were searching on the web to see the, the good translation of the JT. And Terry Gilliam's uh, film 12 Monkeys. So Terry Gilliam 12 Monkeys is from uh, 1995 and La Jeté is from um, 1962. It's often recalled the JT's connection to, um, sorry, the one's connection between the JT and Terry Gilliam's uh, film 12 Monkeys is often recalled. The JT's connection to Steven Spielberg's film Minority Report in 2002 is far less often made. Indeed, the plots in both these movies, Minority Report and Leisure Film, the plot in both these movies are based on the same idea or rather questioning, and on the same sequence of events. An alternate humankind has acquired the power to travel through time by placing several individuals chosen for the intensity of their dreams into a dream state of consciousness, the rapid eye movement, or REM stage in medical terms. And in French, we call it phase de sommeil paradoxal. And it's a, it's a pity we can you know, keep the, the adjective paradoxal, because it's, um, so, I, I continue. And an important detail in both cases, the key element of this reason defying process is the death of a man. Here's pictures of the death of the main character, and here the pictures of minority report. At this point, the dream of prediction, of anticipation, and of protection against a doomed future find its limits. The two heroes cannot prevent the murders. They do not succeed in preserving the status quo, in halting the reversible passage of time. Paradoxically, both films are characterized by happy endings. Temporal order and human mortality are both restored. Another point of ambivalence within this concept of the digital in its unconscious alienation from the language of the machine um, is, uh, is, uh, is to see uh, right now. This alienation has often been an element of cinematic experimentation and is still very much present in current philosophical debates. Paul Mathias, author of a book which in English translates as of, of digital liberties, is our society threatened by the internet, emphasizes that social networks, I quote, the motors of research are not instruments of knowledge, nor are they sites of encounter. These networks are processes, calculation, interpretation of what we say, do, and are. Automated, exploited, traded, and financialized interpretation. The greatest alterity lies in the distinction between language and code. This essential difference lies at the heart of the Wachowski Brother trilogy become called The Matrix. It even constitutes the film's main argument. The revelation of alterity amounts to a confession between the two orders of language and code, proving to be quite dramatic. For Marker, this becomes the argument within the following sequence. Uh, we won't have time to, to see it, so I will just um, give you a, an idea. Um, the main character of the film, Laura, a woman, is trying to, um, um, to finish um, a video program, a game, a video game, uh, from uh, her lover. And she tries and uh, begins to, uh, to dialogue with the computer. But soon she realizes that the computer doesn't speak the same language. <coughs> and as she enters, for example, love, the computer just answers, I do not know love. Or if she asks, uh, for example, um, History or Okinawa, you just say, I do not know Okinawa. 
So he's only capable of understanding code. In this clip, the quid pro quo is contingent on the illusion of an artificial intelligence that effectively hybridizes. Oh, it's so difficult. Uh, I don't know if you could help me. Uh, but ah, hybrid, uh, hybridization. Oh, um, hybridization. Yeah. Yeah. This hybridizes. Hybridizes. Thank you. Humanity is and can be used as a means of conversation. But as a computer response is proved, this conversation doesn't really exist. But as a computer response, um, again, sorry, once a mission sending is discovered, the woman turns the blame back on the machine. However, the absurd dialogue that follows still contain a note of sadness. In all of these examples, the gaining of consciousness breaks a spell. A spell which could have been deadly, but which would also arouse a sort of fear, or feeling of abandonment. Waking from this dream of being, in Freud's words, a prosthetic god is painful for man. Here are um, this neuromancer, and it's, um, it's a picture, a screenshot from the video game, uh, which is an adaptation uh, of uh, a book uh, by uh, William Gibson, which is a reference of Chris Marker when he uh, directed uh, the level 5 movie. The images I chose to show you from science fiction films and from Chris Marker's own work were not done so randomly or for their aesthetically pleasing quality. Perhaps the richness of science fiction can be found in precisely that which has made it an object of mistrust for so long. To see only the expression of simple fantasies in science fiction is, in effect, already to recognize this incredible quality of touching the unconscious. To our eyes, this story, this figure, these images all play a role analogous to the dream state for Gaston Bachelard, formulation of the scientific mind, formation de l'esprit scientifique, which is a quite old uh, book and reference, but um, I don't know if you are familiar with Gaston Bachelard's work, but um, if it's um, an invitation to discover it, it's great, it's also great. <laughs> It is notable that the majority of science fiction films originate in the adaptation of texts written 20 years earlier. Minority Report is the adaptation of a short story published in 1956 by Philip K. Dick, Blade Runner, released in 1982. And uh, Blade Runner, sorry, released in 1982 is adapted from another of the same author books, Do Androids Dream of Electric Ship, which appeared in 1968 four years after the release of Chris Marcus' film, Le Jeté. These historical details support the claim that the philosophical advent of the digital humanities was preceded by, even conditioned by, living works of the visual imagery. In French, living work, œuvre vive, translated as œuvre vive, which actually means topside, the submerged part of a boat hull. Dead work, on the other end, translates literally as œuvre morte, meaning quick work, any part of the boat that remains clear of the water. Naturally, this visual imaginary was one of the exclusive objects in reflection on modernity during the 60s. The 1962 appearance of Marshall McLuhan books, The Gutenberg Galaxy, I don't know if you are familiar with <laughs> I think so seems to be further evidence of this simultaneous and, I believe, directly corresponding transformation. McLean confirms this correlation in the following passage from his essay, La Théorie de l'image, which translates into English as the theory of the image. Uh, I, I give this precision because I, I discovered him in French, so, in which he draws attention to a paradigmatic shift in humanity's sensibility. Here's a quote. These electricity-driven resources, the telegraph, radio, film, telephone, computer, television, represent an extension of our bodily functions or senses, as is the same case with more ancient forms of technology. The wheel is an extension of the foot, clothing an extension of the skin, and the phonetic alphabet an extension of the eye that brought man from the oral and tribal stage to that of the visual. The use of electronics drives the transition from the man of pieces to the integral man. The fact that we find with McLuhan the same ideas and the same examples as those expressed by Freud and Eric Sadin 
<coughs> reinforce this idea of a continuity or of a parallel between the civilization of the image and that of the digital. The Copernican quality of this revolution turns up again in Matrian analytical work. I begin a quote. Most people ignore the influence exerted upon them by the mass media. They forget that the medium, and not what the medium contains, is the message. The content of the message is irrelevant. What matters is that, is that we understand how the medium modifies our senses and our faculties of perception. Once again, it is a question of understanding the relationship with the media's medium as necessarily being one of reciprocity. While the filmmaker chooses to record certain images, those images also choose the filmmaker. No filmmaker has ever conveyed this autonomy of images than Chris Marker. In the several lines advertising these conferences, I chose to characterize his cinema by the immense variety in the nature of the image he used. This formal characteristic reveals both a comprehension of the new civilization of the image and an ethical concern, a comprehension um, potentially a consequence of the former. Television images and archival images are equally numerous and important in Marcus' work, validating MacLean's statements that we live in the era of television. But the parallel between the philosopher and the filmmaker extends even further for the value of the role of televised images are not based solely on the visual testimony they portray, but also on their specific nature and function. McLean tells us that contrary to photographs or to the cinema, the television prolongs the senses of touch more than of sight. Its tactile power is due to the image's lack of intensity, being composed of millions of tiny dots and lines of which the viewer can actually only absorb 50 or 60. Chris Marker gives a particular attention to this, to his image as so, to preserve their specificity within the image of cinematography as a whole. In the 1982 movie Sans Soleil, sometimes translated into English as Sunless, he has the image pass through the zone, la zone. Uh, what you see on the screen is a um, uh, screenshot um, from the installation video, the zapping zone. I would uh, speak about that uh, a little further. Just these two images. And I've prepared also a clip. Actually, it's kind of strange because it's an installation video, it's an art performance, so you are not supposed to uh, film it and uh, see it as a film or a movie on YouTube. Um, it would have been maybe um, better if um, you, you, you film it, you know, it was filmed but from a distance to see how it echoes with all the screen because it, there is not only one screen, TV screen, there are um, at least a dozen of them in the room. Yes, to show you this on the clip. Um, no, that's not it. Finger cross. Yes. At least if you don't understand my English, you would just uh, <laughs> add the, the pictures. So it's. Um, it's a clip from um, Sans Soleil, Sunless, and it shows so, La Zone. And then, in its turn, the journey entered the zone. Da Yao showed me my images already affected by the moss of time, freed of the lie that had prolonged the existence of those moments swallowed by the spiral. When spring came, when every crow announced its arrival by raising his cry half a tone, 
I took the green train of the Yamanote line. Just for you to, to have a touch. Um, actually, the, um, uh, what was uh, uh, put into the zone uh, was a TV reportage uh, filmed in Japan. And uh, he, he chose to, um, and that, that was the only images he, he chose with one, uh, one exception, but that was the only images, um, type of images he chose to uh, put into the zone, the, the, the video images. Um, so the zone is the name the narrator gives to the machine of his friend, a Japanese artist named Ayao Yamaneko, or so we are told in this movie, uh, Sunless. The narrator explains that Yamaneko, I, uh, I quote, calls the images of his machine, the zone, in homage to Tarkovsky. And of course, this machine is a solution to the problem of images of current events, notably the demonstration of the leftist, who at the time had been protesting for 10 years against the construction of the airport in Narita. In effect, the machine is a synthesizer that enables the processing of images, images less deceitful than those seen on TV. At least, they are presented for what they are, images. Not as possible compact forms of reality already inaccessible, but as images that are solarized and reworked with the help of color filters, leaving outlines faded and shapes blurred. This procedure hardly resembles the one used four years earlier for his multimedia video project, Quand le siècle a pris forme, um, it's uh, another um, multimedia installation, um, when the century took shapes. I say oddly because in the case of this work, the device was named Spectrum. Much later, in 2003, during an interview for the French newspaper Libération, that I guess still exists, I'm not sure because I'm not sure I, yet, I was. Yeah, uh, we have to check on the yes. news. To see yeah. if it has disappeared. I don't know. It's a, maybe a private joke, but uh, <laughs> uh, Mark explains. Sunless was shot exclusively with a Beaulieu 16 mm camera. Without sound, there is not one synchronous shot in the film. With 30 meter reels and 2 hours 44 minutes of battery life. And a little cassette player, not even a Walkman, which didn't exist yet. The only high-tech element for its time was the Spectre, an image synthesizer, which we borrowed for a few days. And of course, the machine that was used works for video, not for cinema. That is, it has a low definition resolution, which at the time entailed transferring the raw footage, called dailies or rushes, into video through the process of telecine, treating them with a Spectre, and then transferring them once more this time into film through the process of kinescope. A laborious and costly operation, made even more difficult by the scarcity of available spectrum machine. Beyond a purely aesthetic attraction, like that of the poster appearing all over France in May uh, in 1968, Marker's attachment to the image video origin was a result of the engagements such um, an attachment demanded in the preservation of the image underlying identity. There was only, I guess, uh, I've read, um, three spectrum machines in France at this time. Within the lexical derivation from spectre to spectrum, and then to the zone, is observed the transition from a purely technical and physical conception of the image to one that is more spiritual. The light spectrum is endowed with the spirit, its luminous forms, the landmarks of history, as he called it. The emphasis placed on the autonomy of the video image and the active participation it requires from the viewer, from the viewer, sorry, is also an important feature of McLaren theorizing. McLaren writes, because of this, the television demands active and creative participation from the viewer, who is forced to fill in the blanks of the mosaic of lines and dots to form images. This is illustrated perfectly by Marcus' multimedia installation, Zapping Zone, Proposal for an Imaginary Television, created for the Centre Georges Pompidou in 1985. And um, for those who were in Paris uh, during, the, um, during October, November, I guess, uh, also. But uh, you have the opportunity to see the, the installation in Centre Beaubourg uh, during all these events, uh, La Planète Marqueur. 
The persistent, even irreversible alteration of the human sensorium is not the only point on which McLuhan and Marker agree. I know sensorium is more Benjamin words, and we could maybe uh, talk about that later, but not for now. <laughs> they also both support the economic criticism of digital culture. In 1975, McLuhan wrote that technological information has made it so that money is now based on information. Marker seemed to take up this same idea in 1996 in level five when he said, and maybe I show you the, um, uh, the, the clip, it's, um, it's an important clip, and uh, after, but it's in French. Um, I'm sorry, but um, I've um, made a lot of research to find um, a DVD with an English title, but um, in the release of the Level 5 movie, uh, very recent, there is only, uh, and also in internet, on internet, there is only the French version. Est-ce que tout ça peut être autre chose que les jouets d'un dieu fou qui nous a créés pour les lui construire Imaginez un homme de Néandertal qui a la vision de cette chose-là dans sa tête. Un flash de ville la nuit, avec ses mouvements et ses lumières. Il ne sait rien de ce qui compose cette chose-là. Il a juste eu une vision poétique, pleine de mouvements et de lumière. Il a vu une mer de lumière. Il ne sait pas faire le tri entre toutes les images qui se posent à l'intérieur de sa tête, comme des oiseaux, aussi rapides et irratrapables que des oiseaux. Pensées, souvenirs, visions. Pour lui, tout revient au même, une espèce d'hallucination qui lui fait peur. C'est une vision du même ordre qu'a eu William Gibson en écrivant New Romancer et en inventant le cyberspace. Il a vu une espèce de mer des sargasses, pleine d'algues binaires. Et sur cette image, les Néandertaliens que nous sommes ont commencé à greffer leur propre vision, leurs pensées, leurs souvenirs, des misérables bribes d'informations. Mais aucun de nous ne sait ce qu'est une ville. Only the remote. Um, I will just reduce the, the, the next quote of the film. We used to smile as knowledge circulated on the internet. It was a simple little game, to circulate information faster and faster, faster and faster. In the past, to weigh the power of currency, a material had had to be found, one that could be dense, heavy, rare, and could be used as a form of insurance to be placed in the depths of vaults. As a result, gold was discovered. Now, money had become invisible and volatile. And in order to assure this new power, a new material had to be found, one that would be equally invisible and volatile. The answer lay in knowledge. Atoms of knowledge began appearing across our screen. They were black holes of knowledge, where endless dreams of this century's power were devoured. Sometimes the screen would split apart into great black forms that reminded us of all the forms, those in which the century anticipated its own suicide, inscribing it in our memory the image of cities in ruins. In ruins sorry. They were the ruins of Coventry and of Berlin, of Dresden and of Stalingrad. They were the ruins of Okinawa. And of course, the critic goes on to become more grandiose. Marcus spins an ocean metaphor, then link it to a cosmological metaphor, expressing the force and breadth of its economy of knowledge that is also an economy of power. The interpretation resembles the lesson Levi Strauss gives on writing in his memoir, Triste Tropique, the lesson of writing, I, I don't know the good translation, La Leçon d'Écriture. Only this time it is adapted to the new civilization of the image. But the historical tragedy that should come to a <coughs> significant screen presence recalls other tragedies described by McLuhan in the following passage from Theory of the Image. 
We live in the era of the television. We are submerged in an immense sea of informative messages that make it possible for the individual to contain all humankind at once. The literate man is defeated by the man of electronic mass media. But the very nature of the exchange of electronic data leads to the dissolution of the human family, rather than its groups, for it creates multiple tribal existence. Particularly in highly literate countries, this phenomenon is traumatizing and provokes identity crisis, which in turn can generate violence. It is not easy to live in our time, especially for young people, who are conditioned by television and who are often the most susceptible to identity crisis. The principal danger is thus the danger of alienation. What inspires the reflection, this reflection by McLuhan is a simple device, but one which is highly efficient and characterizes an infinite richness that echoes uh, this question of identity. The images is projected onto the face of a statue that will be placed in front of a screen. That's the description of uh, what you actually um, showed, uh, actually watched, sorry, uh, in the beginning of the movie. So the image is projected onto the face of a statue that will be placed in front of a screen. The face of the statue appears to come to life. This impression could be further strengthened by the reflection of our own faces as spectators. Have you ever watched a face be lit up by a screen? I don't know if you have made this experience. You're just entering a room, a dark room, there is someone in front of a computer. It's quite strange to, to have this uh, image in, in mind. That it's a little uh, like this. It resembles the spectral images so much in style during the early stage of photography. More than a cheaply obtained special effect, it exposes the genie within the medium. While this could seen as an example of a mise en abyme, such a comparison would also need to, in some way, include the viewer of the film. The mise en abyme. Um, moreover, the mise en abyme, based on the repetition of the same motif, does not apply here since the images change. It turns out, it turns, sorry, it turns out that metonymy is a device that corresponds to the visual effect of this series of, of faces. Metonymy is a figure of speech designating a conceptual entity, sorry, entity, whereby one term is used to signify another term, of which the former is some element or with which it is associated. The relation of contiguity established between the screen and the person watching it thus portends what the film itself will be a reflection on the technological and cultural revolution and on the confronting of our digital humanity. Marcus' particular strategy of encounter between the viewer and the screen effectively diminishes what, in the world of cinematic experience, would otherwise lead to the viewer's alienation from reality. If the notion of a comprehensive film's, um, film seems out of place in the cases of Chris Marker, comprehensive film or resumptive film, um, yes, perhaps we could try to apply the notion of a resumptive film. So much does it reuse and rework various narrative scenes and intrigues. In particular, the disappearance of the hero, the subsequent impossibility of dialogue with the lover. A new responsibility could carry out the hero's quest and recount his tale. Because like I said earlier, the main character, Laura, uh, the woman, um, is trying to uh, to finish the work of uh, a lower who disappeared. I think I have to switch the input for oh, the image because we're. Um... Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. Sure. Let's go. So you didn't see all the images. No. I, no. I, I was seeing in the small screen. Voila. Voila. So. We saw, we did see... Okay, yes. that was bad. Um, it, it's just, you just uh, told them uh, just before when I um, show you the clip, but um, here is with uh, some uh, English title. Uh, there is an only part that was translated into English. That's quite interesting. <laughs> uh, imagine the Neanderthal. Um, I have made some editing, so uh, it's not um, in the order of... Um, but uh, I guess with uh, this order, uh, the subtitle makes a different uh, sentence.
So imagine the tall man glimpsing what it's, can this be that land in his mind, all motion and light, all motion and light, a sea of lights, he cannot unravel the images. And here I come to my next part. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so uh, yes, all this was already apparent in Sans Soleil and was beginning to develop in the jetty. Uh, let's observe, however, that the disappearance of the hero in level 5 is not presented as death. Laura, the main character, even believes on a number of occasions that she will find him hiding behind one of the avatars she encounters in the OW, so our network, the optional world link. This ambiguity seems to impress a subtle yet real distinction between the two processes of disappearance and alienation. Marker imposes or prefers the uncertain and novelistic conditions of the subject disappearance to the radical and moral condition of alienation. This triumph is also that of ambiguity over ambivalence. Chris Marker does, does far more than offer an axiological judgment on this new digital humanity according to the values of good and evil. He, sorry, he invites us into a heuristic work of discovery, not to judge but to understand what threatens us in this digital humanity born of the civilization of the image. Moreover, the beginning of level five seems to take up the commentary begun several years earlier in his 1989 film, The Owl's Legacy, during the debate between Michel Serre, uh, Yanis Xenakis, I'm sorry if I dropped name, you don't know, it's a kind of snob, uh, but <laughs> these people were quite important and are still quite important uh, for the uh, intellectual debate. So Michel Serre, uh, Yanis Xenakis, Cornelius Castorialis, Jean-Pierre Vernon, Julia Sissa, and a few of the other guests of this reincarnation of um, Plateau's banquet. This critic builds upon the question of idolatry, introduced by the phrase, particularly noteworthy for our purpose, where trajectory from chaos to artistic production would be perpetually accomplished under the gaze of monumental machine, we would reign like idols. And if there still remains some doubts about correspondence between digital and visual culture, Jean-Pierre Vernon's speech surely sweeps them away when he defies his idols as, I quote, little replicas, particles, I dare say tiny bodies that are also dream images which appear in the head of the sleeper and which are real things and which are the, the apparitions sent by the gods to mortals, meaning that they are always phantoms. Let's listen now to some of the opening line of level five. Could all, that's a translation um, by Rachel, um, Rachel, sorry, uh, of the, what you show on, on the clip. Could all this be anything but the playthings of a mad girl who made us to create them for him? Imagine a Neanderthal man who has a vision of this. He has only had a poetic vision full of movements and light. He has seen a sea of light. He doesn't know how to sort out all the images which land inside his head like birds, as swift and ungraspable as birds. Thoughts, memories, vision. For him, it all comes down to the same thing, a kind of hallucination that frightens him. And of course, the beginning of level five, by reviving this debate, as well as Plato's ancient banquets, seems to affirm the filmmaker's loyalty to the humanist enterprise. To restructure knowledge through the rereading of ancient text and myth, and to employ the allegory of as a heuristic mode. The final installment in the whole um, Howl legacy is even more pertinent to my commentary, as it develops the fear linked to this new vision. And sometimes, I quote, the eyes are the very medium of terror. The voiceover solemnly proclaims. The voice relates this fear to the myth of the Gorgon. It's parallel with level five, anticipating our interpretation of the face of the statue as we face the screen. Another quotation from the Owl's Legacy. There is therefore, between the eye of the Gorgon and you, as you watch it, a kind of mirrored exchange. 
to the effect that you enter fascinated into the domain that is this others. And suddenly you change yourself into a type of mask, an invisibility, a monstrous thing. But while Marker employs this myth in order to convey the inherent dangers of the digital, one could likewise find evidence in the myth to support the contrary. This was first expressed by Jean-Pierre Vernon, who remarked the following on Perseus' heroic act. There is thus, I quote, a certain way, through images as through stories, of disarming this dreadful, horrible creature of death that is expressed by such monstrous face and manifested in that gaze. It is also by turning the unseen into the object of figurative expression. End of quote. The myth is again alluded to by the voiceover in a highly paradoxical manner. Construct a figurative montage of the myth and the allegory of the Platonic cave. After faithfully reprising Plato's text, Mark closes this chapter with the following question. And uh, I guess I could, I could show you the, the clip right now. Il s'ouvrira. Figure-toi des hommes dans une demeure souterraine en forme de caverne, ayant sur toute sa largeur une entrée ouverte à la lumière. Ces hommes sont là depuis leur enfance, les jambes et le cou enchaînés, de sorte qu'ils ne peuvent bouger ni voir ailleurs que devant eux. La lumière leur vient d'un feu qui brûle assez loin derrière eux. Entre le feu et les prisonniers passe une route. Imagine que le long de cette route est construit un petit mur, pareil aux cloisons que les montreurs de marionnettes dressent devant eux, et au-dessus desquels ils montrent leur merveille. Je vois cela. Figure-toi maintenant le long de ce petit mur des hommes portant des objets de toutes sortes et des statuettes d'hommes et d'animaux. Un étrange tableau et d'étranges prisonniers. Penses-tu qu'ils aient jamais vu autre chose d'eux-mêmes et de leurs voisins que les ombres projetées par le feu sur la paroi de la caverne Comment pourraient-ils S'ils pouvaient s'entretenir ensemble, ne penses-tu pas qu'ils prendraient pour des objets réels les ombres qu'ils verraient Nécessairement. Qu'on détache un de ces prisonniers. Qu'on le force à se dresser, à lever les yeux sur la lumière. Il s'ouvrira. Et si on l'arrache de sa caverne par force si on ne le lâche pas avant d'avoir traîné jusqu'à la lumière du soleil, ne se plaindra-t-il pas de ses violences Et lorsqu'il sera parvenu à la lumière, pourra-t-il distinguer une seule des choses que nous appelons vraie Il ne le pourra pas. En 1940, Simone Veil écrivait « Les cinémas parlants ressemblent assez à cette caverne. » Ce n'était pas un compliment. Pouvait-elle accepter que cet art inférieur exerce dans la caverne même le pouvoir de nier la caverne de désarmer la gorgone, de se nouer au fil de la création humaine et de créer finalement ses propres mythes. Tu n'as rien vu à Hiroshima, rien. <coughs> so, um, Mark closes his chapter with a, the following question um, in 19... 40 Simon Veil wrote that the cinema somewhat, you, you just heard of it. Uh, this conception of cinema is in an obvious and exemplary manner at the origin of level five, which resumes the humanist legacy and which successfully puts down the challenge raised. In fact, this idea seems to me to be already at work in Marker's earlier films. I would like in the third part of my lecture, which will be very, very short, don't worry, and to come back to this cosmology, uh, these Marcarian mythologies, at once a universal practice and a critical practice in the realm of filmmaking. So that is uh, the last part, disarming the Gorgon, sorry, and preserving the legacy of human creation, poetic strategies as resistant to digital humanity. This anecdote, which appears in uh, Vin Vendor's documentary film Tokyo Gap, illustrates the primary way in which Chris Marker achieves resistance to such alienation. Paradoxically, this first poetic strategy relies heavily on the use of mask. Glimpsing the lens of the camera, he blocks his face with the drawing of a cat, his fetish animal. 
This substitution is not the result of a photographer's simple vanity, refusing to take part in his own game. Rather, a more conspirational significance is at play. Such a reaction recalls the original defiance, defiance of those who lived by brutes, of those who believe that the photographic image held a magical power. Assuming a mask meant not being trapped, immobilized, says, it means not losing one's soul. Thus, here the purpose of the totem animal would be to signify the taboo against portrait. This refusal was thereafter consistently maintained. Car has a cliche about this faceless author withdrawn into invisibility. This stance with an undeniable romantic power in the legacy it leaves to the imagination and to fantasy. The author's fragmented photography, fragmatic, uh, fragmented, oh, sorry, fragmented photography presenting itself as a free and enigmatic figure, one which of course never failed to inspire in novelists the desire to create a character out of it, or rather to propose their interpretation of it. But above all, his photography invited transgression of a certain prejudice of photography as mimesis of reality and instrument of knowledge. Evading investigation of the photographic print, it presents only a mask or trace, covered up and undone. The results of this restrictive formulation are in no way lacking. In fact, it is the teasing out and illuminating of particular features or of their transformation that his principle of invention lies. Also for the reader of viewer, the impossibility of obtaining a fixed, definite image from the artist may stand as an impasse to any biographical reading of it. The dismantling of such a conception of the subject actually liberates him from the constraints of a pre-existing narrative. Moreover, his audience is led to the understanding that the photographic image is always in a state of becoming and that the first interpretation is never the last. The image is characterized by the multiplicity in the sense that it calls to all the images, to all the discourses, and to all the stories. Therefore, this preliminary tactic of concealment establishes a particular comprehension of the image where the amount of time spent on its meditation is inextricably linked to the effects had on the imagination. The author invisibility is all the more intriguing for this ceaseless production of images, multiplying their forms and mediums. In effect, Chris Marker is simultaneously traveler, writer, filmmaker, and photographer, a man of action and a man of intellect, a man of the camera and a man of letters. I mean a man of letters in the historical sense, since Marker always tended to assume a humanistic attitude, an attitude which became an almost inherent effect in his work. And that's maybe the reason why he, he seems uh, sometimes um, a little um, ancient to the students, to the young people, with uh, the sound of the voice, uh, the, the pace of the reading, uh, for example. Marker, author of the book Giraudou by himself, director of the film The Jeté, and producer of the CD-ROM In Memory, reveals himself to be a well-rounded man and uniting scholarship with action, a taste for civility with a critical boldness, perpetual moving between them. He was also fascinated by new techniques of expression and representation, by their functions as well as by the emotion they could provoke. At last, Marcus' complexity can really only be embodied by one image, the man of cats, like them, possessing multiple lives and the skill of illusion. This effective erasure of the individual in favor of an invented, anonymous, and fragmented character underlines the latent novelistic power present in his film. The avatar is like a venture into fiction, and thus a way to avoid the gaze of the Gorgon and subsequent petrification. Um, I will just, um, because I, I don't have uh, so much time for, for all this reading, <laughs> Um, yeah, I will just show you one last piece. Um, Where everything be and it uh, will give me time to recollect my thoughts also. 
So uh, is this is good. Um, So the script is there. Um, it's, uh, it's taken from Sans Soleil, Sunless, and um, um, it, um, it will give me the, the opportunity to uh, to speak um, about uh, not self-portrait but portrait of other people, and especially women. So here is a clip, and after that, I will just give some uh, very confusing thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> He wrote me that the pictures of Guinea-Bissau ought to be accompanied by music from the Cape Verde Islands. That would be our contribution to the unity dreamed of by Amilcar Cabral. Why should so small a country, and one so poor, interest the world? They did what they could. They freed themselves. They chased out the Portuguese. They traumatized the Portuguese army to such an extent that it gave rise to a movement that overthrew the dictatorship and led one, for a moment, to believe in a new revolution in Europe. Who remembers all that? History throws its empty bottles at the window. This morning I was on the dock at Pijiguiti, where everything <coughs> began in 1959, when the first victims of the struggle were killed. It may be as difficult to recognize Africa in this leaden fog as it is to recognize struggle in the rather dull activity of tropical longshoremen. Rumor has it that every third world leader coined the same phrase the morning after independence. Now the real problems start. Cabral never got a chance to say it. He was assassinated first. But the problem started and went on and are still going on. So um, for now, we are just watching some usual stuff by Chris Marker, uh, speaking about uh, political engagement. But um, what strikes me uh, uh, very much is uh, what we are going to follow. And uh, when you talk about the real problem, um, I just, that is my, my thesis, but uh, it's not about political, it's about what we will follow in the, the, the exchange of, uh, of look between him and a, and a woman. Rather unexciting problems for revolutionary romanticism. To work, to produce, to distribute, to overcome post-war exhaustion, temptations of power and privilege. Ah oh, well, after all, history only tastes bitter to those who expected it to be. Sugar coated. And another interruption. Um, the sigh you just heard with a voice, you know, with a, with a, with a, with a reading voice, you say, oh, like, it doesn't exist in the French version. <laughs> so, it's like, um, I have to read this uh, very, you know, monotone and uh, uh, a little boring things about revolutions, and uh, but here's the stream. <laughs> My personal problem was more specific. How to film the ladies of Bissau? Apparently, the magical function of the eye was working against me there. It was in the marketplaces of Bissau and Cape Verde that I could stare at them again with equality. I see her. She saw me. She knows that I see her. She drops me her glance but just at an angle where it is still possible to act as though it was not addressed to me. <coughs> and at the end, the real glance, straightforward, that lasted a twenty-fourth of a second, the length of the film frame. All women have a built-in grain of indestructibility, and men's task has always been to make them realize it as late as possible. African men are just as good at this task as others, but after a close look at African women, I wouldn't necessarily bet on the men. Um, indeed, photography is at the fore in this piece, and the objection, um, um, Marcus surely has a, 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 so sorry, the segments slowly breaks down the subtle movement leading up to the eye contact and develops a very particular blending of provocation, interrogation and seduction. It seems to me, however, that the static shot, the narrow framing, the cameraman's discretion and related to this a woman's near immobility 
all also work to inscribe this sequence shot in the tradition of the photographic portrait. The span of the sequence is less about the description of a particular movement than it is about an attempt to create a multidimensional portrait, an anamorphic portrait owing to an account of the tiny angles changes caused by the jostling of the frame. The slightly out of focus quality, thematically speaking, is explained by the photographic essence of these images. The efficiency of the whole process and its universal relevance are thus explained the psychoanalysis Serge Tisseron. I quote, photography is less a way of stopping time following the classical notion of the symbolic execution than it is a way to feel the pain of passing time. This is realized through photography's engagement with the two at once contradictory and complementary psychological processes of shooting and breaking and of log-in connection. The cinema of Chris Marker never fails to place the viewer in a position where he or she is able to feel the pain of passing time. And perhaps this is the key to the effectiveness of his film, poetic strategy in the face of the potential alienation of digital humanity. Adopting parallel qualities to those of the novel, this technique paves the way for an imaginary not distinct from the real, but which, on the contrary, is deeply grounded in it. A dialectical cinema, a cinema dialectic. The first person to use this term with reference to Marco was Barbara Lemaitre in an article Sans Soleil, Le Travail de l'Imaginaire, which in English means Sans Soleil, the work of the imaginary, in which he refers to a formulation by Edgar um, Morin, cinema reflects man's mental exchange with the world. Drawing inspiration from photography to construct his cinematic montage, Chris Marker elucidates the flow inherent in the art of cinema, the impossible capture resulting in the reduction of a universe to two dimensions, but also of duration <coughs> to a single shot. In a sense, a return to a more ancient form of art, less comprehensive, a lack of completeness, if you will, inherited through the mimetic illusion of recording. The analytic work required of the spectator involves the unconscious departure of the film image, a technical repression rooted in the presence of photography, leaving the image clearer and thus more comprehensible. To play the flows inherent in film is to let the shadow spread and the, invis in the, invis oh, sorry, and the invisible appear. Not to make people believe in an afterlife or a world beyond, but to rediscover the aura of the here and now, and the joy of living in the moment. It is to initiate from the reduced, finite time of the image, the slow, infinite process of the imaginary. Finally, it is to invert the mechanism of projection in order for the viewer to interior interiorize that which is projected. The viewer makes these technological issues his own. He shares in the image flows in trying to grasp the surrounding world, perhaps likening them to his own fears and desires about his search for inner unity. It's cinema that works to reconcile man and machine. And um, maybe I will just stop um, here and um, let, uh, let us discuss and have a dialogue instead of uh, reading more, more and more pages. <laughs> Um, so maybe a, a last, uh, last few sentences. Um, uh, you have to conclude. Yeah. Yes, yes. So to conclude, the cinema of Chris Marker constructs a relationship between the viewer and the screen so that the image of the world is neither frozen in time nor lost in a black hole, in a sense avoiding the gaze of the Gorgon. I can just say with conviction, and uh, you wouldn't, maybe you won't um, understand these uh, references, these invisible references, but um, the last sentence is uh, largely inspired by the last sentence of uh, the Diderot's work, Le Rêve de D'Alembert, D'Alembert um, Dream, or I guess. I can just say with conviction that in the case of Chris Marker, there exists no difference between a filmmaker who travels and a philosopher who dreams. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, I kind of want to uh, have you elaborate on the footnote you made for, for Benjamin, 
new dock. In part because, as you got towards the end, um, you, I think you're proposing that Chris Marker is basically attempting to mediate uh, a, a fraught, dangerous relation between uh, humans and technology, which is clearly what Benjamin also was concerned with, right? and, uh, and, and the concept of innovation, right? the way of somehow re recreating a relation through which technology and the body can be entangled, but in a non-destructive way. Uh, I wonder if this parallel, if, if you can elaborate on this parallel, if, that, if, that's, if I'm reading it right, or you know, what's the relation to Benjamin? Because then we're, we're transposing very much of the same type of, uh, it's, it's a, a kind of humanism, but now in a very different technological context, right, than, than it was in the, in the 20s and 30s. Yeah, but um, what strikes me is also that um, the, the quotes by Freud, for example, mm -hmm. and, uh, the one by um, McLean, and uh, the other one by Eric Sadin or whoever, you know, are quite the same. And uh, between Benjamin and Marker, I guess there is this uh, sense of continuity uh, in the reflection on this debate. And for example, um, the definition by Benjamin of the aura, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know the, the right translation in, uh, in English, so sorry for that, but uh, this strange feeling, uh, you know, associated with um, what you, you, you see, you know, the, the, the mountains in the, uh, very far from, uh, from the viewer, and the sense of uh, proximity. Uh, it's also something very near from um, what I tried to, uh, to call vertigo, relative. Mm -hmm. And I just realized how difficult it is to, uh, to explain it um, while working with Rachel, because uh, it was very difficult to, um, to find the, uh, the right translation to describe the feeling we could have uh, during uh, Chris Marker's work, but it's, um, I guess that uh, Chris Marcus wanted to, um, to attend this kind of aura, but using not all photographs, like the example used by uh, Benjamin, um, which by the way, were photographs of women and vendeuses, the vendeuses uh, de poisson, and uh, he tried... Fishmongers, yeah, female fishmongers. Yeah, so... Female fishmongers. Female fishmongers, and in this, um, in these movies, um, there is an obsession about um, uh, captures uh, the right, uh, the right image, the right pictures, and I guess that is his way to um, maybe to uh, to find again to fight against uh, the, what Benjamin called um, the disappearance of aura. Uh, but he is also like Benjamin, conscious that um, the risk is high because of television and video, and now with the uh, internet. So I guess uh, this is this sense of um, continuous fight. I don't know if I exactly answer. Hi. Um, that's, yeah, there's a lot <coughs> here. But, um, so I actually wanted to, just a, a, as a side note, point out that there is a, a, a DVD edition of Level 5 really? by Optimum with English subtitling, which is a UK edition. So. You could have been my savior. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. Um, I think it came out maybe three years ago or something like that. Um, I'm not quite sure about Benjamin, the connection between Benjamin, McLuhan, and um, Marker here. And the reason I say this is because I think that the concept of the aura is a bit more complicated in his work in that he's much more conscious of um, unlike his you know, peers during that period of the, the possibility, the potential uh, the revolutionary potential that is part and parcel of this doing away with you know, the, the aura, this elitist kind of um, appreciation, potentially this kind of appreciation that is connected with um, art, uh, as opposed to the technological version of, the mediated version of art. Um, which is also my problem with McLuhan, who for me is very strictly devoted to some kind of technological determinism. Um, and I don't know if that 
means anything to you, or how, yeah, how that could, could connect back to Marker and what, what Marker is doing. Because Marker is also, you know, it's, it's amazing how interested he is in technology. And there's constantly this, the way that he creates his images and, and the voiceover, there is this strong nostalgia. I don't know if I can save him from that nostalgia, or if I just need to let it be. <laughs> First, I, I knew it was uh, these references were very tricky. And, okay. Uh, I, to be frank and honest, I hesitated to, to use the word sensorium, uh, sensorium. But um, um, the relationship between Marker and Benjamin uh, is very strong for me because uh, there is another quote from um, Chris Marker. Maybe you 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 know it. Uh, he's talking about uh, is that uh, the Spectron uh, installation. This installation, a video installation. Um, that's uh, the images um, that he put in, uh, in sunlight in the zone, and he describes these pictures I, uh, as um, les poubelles de l'histoire, the, 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 the history, the, the rubbish of history, yeah. the rubbish of history, uh, which is which resonates um, very strongly with um, what Benjamin called the bribes de l'histoire, or what he tries to do uh, in his own way, and uh, the tension between nostalgia and uh, a kind of um, uh, enthusiasm with um, the different technologies uh, of images and pictures. Um, uh, this extension is quite the same uh, in Benjamin for me, uh, in Benjamin and in Marcus. Um, and also the way that Marker uh, provides um, a lot of innovative images. But uh, the voiceover and the text he, he wrote for all these films are quite um, very classical. Well, he wrote a book on Giraudoux, which is, you know, quite surprising. Yes. Because uh, Giraudoux is really maybe one of the most conservative. And what I uh, didn't tell you, um, and I, I just discovered, you know, Macmillan uh, earlier works uh, were on uh, author, on literature. And I find it quite interesting that at the same period for Macmillan and Marker, and um, and other um, writers that uh, I'm passionate about, uh, Nicolas Bouvier, who was also not a filmmaker, but uh, photographs, a uh, writer, traveler. And there is this, uh, this same, um, they, they all share a preoccupation about you know, the, the, the culture they, they have grown in, the, the humanist classical culture, and uh, also this, um, this kind of new uh, technology and uh, new humanity. That's the reason why I try to uh, to attach all the the quote from uh, the visual era of uh, the era or civilization of images to the uh, reflection um, that nowadays is about uh, digital humanity. Um, but you're right. Um, the definition of sosayum is far more complex and um, maybe um, uh, far more um, satisfying than the, the, the accept or the quotes from the Macaulay works. Which was, which is now uh, quite updated, but um, yeah, I have a sense that there's some, this, you know, kind of moved beyond my fluent in, in many ways, um, but he's, I guess, useful for understanding, uh, a, you know, technological kind of interpretation during a specific period. Yeah, thanks. And as uh, many of these uh, authors, uh, I quote, um, Mila Doueri, Eric Sabin, Paul Mathias, McLuhan. Um, they all try to, um, to, um, to, to propose a new big history. Uh, and that's not the case for Benjamin or for uh, Marker. Um, in contrary, Marker tries to, um, uh, to convey us uh, to, um, not, to, to, be, um, not to, to hold to this uh, big history or big narrative. Um, as a viewer, we are compelled to, um, to, to this feeling of vertigo, vertige des temps. You cannot trace um, some, um, and when he called uh, les bribes de l'histoire or the rubbish of history, um, oh sorry, um, he called them also the landmarks of history. But um, these landmarks are not um, easily interpreted because um, the Spectron installation video is very simple. You have uh, three types of images, blue and black, uh, red and black, and uh, yellow and black, which have to correspond to Russian history, German history, and French history. 
uh, that is not very um, you know, satisfying for someone who wants a big narrative and this kind of uh, uh, now is the age of access, the age of uh, technological intuition. I think you have two questions. One here, which is a comment on the question here. It's just a quick addendum. Let's not forget that the medium is the message was actually the medium is the massage. It's massage, yes. <laughs> it was a technological error in the print run in the first edition of McLuhan. And the message took off. But I want to reintroduce massage. Yeah, because... Uh, if, you, if you think of... Yeah, your point about it, it work. touching. <laughs> yeah, so I just remind all of us of what what was McLuhan's original um, formulation, which I think does have a connection with your um, it's very thinking it's, with it's, uh, thinking primordially with touch. It's quite current with what he um, uh, he said or described uh, <laughs> when he, he spoke about the prosthetic god and prosthetic man. Yeah, I wanted just to, to go back actually to what Marcos had said and also you about the, the problem regarding this notion of aura, how it could be really applied to, to Marker. What really strikes me in his last words and um, Zapping Zone um, is that he stages those digital clips, those elements from new media, but he uses objects, hardware, that are already marked by obsolescence. And I think that here, the, the, he, this notion of nostalgia, which is really at the core of his last words, is that, that's exactly where I think the, the site for tension is. So I, it's not exactly a question, but I wonder if you could say perhaps a bit more about this, what I feel to be a constantation in, in Marker's last words the way he stages those, those digital elements <coughs> with objects, for instance, the, the old Apple computer that he has, that it was already discontinued when, 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 kind uh, of when, when it came out. Yeah, well, <laughs> not so, so. It, it, it evolves so uh, rapidly and so fast that, yes, uh, I guess that uh, this uh, computer will be just, uh, you know, as an ancient form of computer uh, in, uh, in five, uh, five years, I guess. But, um, uh, it, it was, um, I, I, I made a choice so, um, for this conference and this lecture because I know that um, um, Guy Gauthier, for example, had already, um, has already sorry, um, given a commentary about um, e-memory, for example, or Zapping Zone, or even Level 5, uh, all the works about and with um, computers and um, new forms and new technological forms and he insists about the nostalgia because um, it helps to understand how Chris Marker uh, reflects on the memory and the work of the memory. But um, for this lecture I, I try to um, not to uh, recall all this reflection about uh, how a filmmaker uh, deals with memory, his memory or the memory uh, he had about the, the history of the world because Chris Marker is a traveler and he, he shows um, quite fascinating uh, <laughs> countries to, uh, to visit and live in uh, Japan, Korea, uh, North Korea, uh, Cuba, etc., etc. And he used um, all these pictures and images and uh, clips in the, um, in the last movies, and, uh, for example, in level five. Um, but I try to understand how, aside this uh, evident nostalgia that could occur to, um, to the viewer, uh, there is also a sense of uh, innovation. We, we, uh, we speak about the film, uh, um, the Chris Marker, an innovative filmmaker. And then after, we, we just uh, reduce him as, oh, he reflects on the evolution of the technology and he's nostalgic of ancient photographs. And I guess that's right. That's, um, but also, and that's the same for me, um, when I read Benjamin, there is uh, this kind of enthusiasm. And this kind of, um, we, we have to be here, and uh, the aura, the, the definition of aura, is not about only an old photograph, it's about a sightseeing, something uh, that we all can feel, you know, when you see uh, the, the mountain over there. So, um, in that sense, I, I think that uh, Level 5, for example, and Imemori, um, because they are mostly Imemori, because they are um, uh, always unfinished, 
I don't know if many of uh, of you have tried to uh, to play in memory. Because you, you don't see memory. It's not a, a movie to see. It's a, it's a program. It's like a video game in level five. You can play it infinitely because there is no um, no final part. There is a it's a, an endless quest. And uh, so that that was this um, this choice he made that for me was uh, the difference between nostalgia. Uh, with that can um, result in um, in a deception or in um, a feeling of dereliction, dereliction. I don't know if it's good. And um, and um, and the choice he made to transform that into uh, a game. Um, and uh, that's uh, the last part of the level five movie. But he, he uses another metaphor. But I have to um, to to choose some um, to make choices, but. Um, at the end of the game, she discovers that uh, her lover, who invented the video game, um, and uh, that's uh, very uh, Perekian, that's a semi that's that uh, Perek used, uh, he has invented a puzzle. But uh, the puzzle is like a monochrome puzzle. <laughs> it's like a blue clan. Uh, so um, it, it says, uh, it says sorry, um, the, the fact that Marker tries to, um, to play with the viewer. Mm -hmm. In a very uh, joyful and playful way, I guess. So that that counts, and for me, that balance a little bit the nostalgia, the evidence, yeah. and natural nostalgia. No, no, I, guess, as well. I, I get that. I wasn't implying that Chris Marker was, you know, one of those guys who regret the time yeah. who it was before. But I, I know it. Sometimes he has been perceived like that. Yes. But also, I think in nostalgia and obsolescence don't don't have to be collapsed because they they actually very interesting kept apart, mm -hmm. right? I mean to. Like untimeliness, obsolescence, debris, those categories don't have to be filtered through a humanist nostalgia. Uh, they can be, but they don't have to. And I think that's one of the questions, right? Mm -hmm. Is that is that can that be separated in his work, or can he be saved from his nostalgia? But mm -hmm. uh, Well, if not, it remains for us to thank Jean-Francois and to stay and to have a drink with us.